Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas, happy solstice. Gifts abound. Tis the season of gifts of all kinds and of all traditions. Gifts from Santa's sack, gelt, the chocolate coins wrapped in fo gold foil, creative handmade gifts of Kwanzaa, gifts of light of the solstice. It is also a season of anticipation and the wonder about gifts. With anticipation, we wonder what package might be at our door or, what, who and who, or whose tidings are included in festive red envelope in the mailbox. We wait with anticipation as we hope that our gifts, whatever given or received, are what we expected and what we hope and that no one will be disappointed. Then too, this is a season of reflection. We reflect on times past about the gifts we have received. We might find ourselves smiling or perhaps we find ourselves with furrowed brow as we remember what our stockings once held, either the best gifts or the worst gifts. There are many to stories to be told. I recall a huge package one year I think I was about six. It was actually wrapped in paper that had not been used before. It contained doll dishes from my sister Norma. I could barely breathe and for a minute I did not want to open that box because I thought it was so pretty. The dishes were plastic yet they were so elegant. The plates had scalloped lacy edges and there were ruby colored goblets and the best yet, tiny little settings of silverware. This present made me feel very grown up, that my dolls could sit at a beautiful table complete with silverware that matched. This present was from the city where my sister went to college. It was unlike any present my little girlfriends would receive. Years later, as a teenager, I badly wanted that pinky ring made of Black Hills gold. It was one of those trendy teenage things that girls wore in those days. And the rings were from a real jeweler, John Stockhill Jewelers. That meant they were real jewelry and not something from the Avon lady. I did not really think I was going to get that ring, but my parents did indeed give it to me. Not only did I feel grown up e enough to wear real jewelry, but I felt like my parents thought I was sufficiently grown up to own it. I was gravely disappointed when two days later I lost that ring. It fell off my hand into a slushy road when I took my glove off, and I was sick with guilt for losing that ring. My mother's, silent about, my mother's silence about the whole affair reinforced that guilt so that I learned never to ask for another piece of jewelry. And one year I received a gravy boat. The silver gravy boat was from my old friend Ruth who lived in a nursing home. That was the last of what she had stowed away from her china cabinet. She had it resilvered and polished just for me. It was all she had. It's tarnished now, but the memory of how much I loved her is not. In this reflection about gifts, I remembered too that the story is not about the gift itself. Rather, the gift is simply an icon or a symbol. The stories, and of any of our life stories, are about relationships between the giver and the receiver. These are stories of love and delight, or of disappointment, or of acceptance, forgiveness, or perhaps reconciliation. These stories about gifts are stories about relational behavior rather than about objects. Now back to the present. I invite you to reflect on the relationships here in this fellowship. This is no ordinary place. Rather, I believe it's a sacred place because it is here that we as Unitarian Universalists learn and practice to live out one of the most valued and treasured gifts of all. The best gift, I believe, is the gift of our promises. That is, how we determine to give in a way that we would want to receive. 
If you consider the word promise as a noun, such as a vow, or better yet in our Unitarian Universalist tradition, a covenant, it is a pledge to do or give something, and it is an expectation that something may be received, something promised back to you. When I look at the root word of promise, root meaning of promise, I found that it means to send forth. With such sending forth, we anticipate an outcome. Thus, I invite you to consider that a promise is a creative process of making a gift the creative art of learning how to give and how to receive. Religious ethicist from Center College, the Reverend Dr. Eric Mount, taught that throughout history, the concept of covenant was seen as a gift from God. Yet in my personal religious humanist theology, I believe we experience the gift of covenant as we learn and practice how to create sacredness in our relationships and how to find the divine in our lives by living out our promises and living in covenant with each other. This is no ordinary place. It is here that we learn the, the creative process of making the gift of promises something extraordinary, that is, making the gift of our promises into something sacred. Within this community, we find and feel the sacred connection in our relationship so that the divine is manifest between humans, from human heart to human heart, from human hand to human hand. We bond human to human by living out those promises, those covenants. Of course, th of course things, those tangible objects, are important. We are called to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, rebuild the nations. Of course we need food, warm coats, bricks and mortar. Yet, yet, as Unitarian Universalists, we are also called to engage in relational behaviors called love and hope and trust and compassion. It is precisely here that I engage in the age-old questions. Just what are the rules of giving? What is it that our promises send forth? Does somebody need to ask before I give them something? Do I need to give because someone needs me or because I want to give? Do I give in private or do I give in public? And what if it turns out that my gift given to someone I could never hope to like, much less love? So when I'm troubled, when I ask myself if I'm giving correctly and if I'm living out my promise the right way, I return to one of my favorite stories. Some of you may remember this. Several years ago, Michael Jones and I created a play about giving that the children performed. The story is called Getting It Right. It's by um, a Jewish woman named Rachel Naomi Remen. And she wrote the story based on the teachings of Rabbi Maimonides. I reflect on this story which taught that, quote, some things have so much goodness in them that they are worth doing any way you can. And that it is better to bless life badly than not bless at all. In short, Remen reminded me that we learn as we go. Yes, I believe that there is so much good in living out our promises that we must do it in whatever way we can, the best way we know how at any given moment. We learn as we go. We see glimpses of the gift of our promise, so we try again the next day and then the next day after that. But there is more. There is gift in our promise, but there is a greater blessing, I believe, in promises of our covenant on which we call to share a love of mutual regard and so that we learn by giving and receiving. Since we were little kids, we were taught that it's better to give than to receive. As I've grown up, I've tried to believe this. 
Yes, I do believe that I benefit when I give something away. I believe Isaiah's teaching that when I offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, that my light shall rise in the darkness and my gloom will be like noonday. I believe that. I know it's true. Yet, I, it's not all there is. Rather than teaching that it is better to give than to receive, perhaps a better lesson would be it is best when we learn how to give and how to receive. For this, this love of mutual regard is what sustains us. Gifts, whether given or received, are not given and received tit for tat in equal measure. There are times when we have received gifts beyond any measure than we can return. Except to receive this gift with a grateful heart and play it forward when we're able. There are other times when we give beyond our means and, accepting, and accept nothing more than the spoken words, thank you. Yes, I need to give. I am called to give. But I also need to be in a covenantal, promising relationship. I need to be in a place of love, of mutual regard, that I can also receive in order to sustain myself. I need you to love me, to feed me when I am hungry, to soothe me when I'm afflicted with guilt or shame or when I'm afraid. I need these gifts from others, and so do you. In this sacred community, we learn and practice how to engage in relational behaviors in order to create a new life or the gift of the beloved community. Living out our promises means we are willing to do the hard work that it takes to make justice happen so that every human being, including you and me, receives respect and treated with dignity. Living out our promises means that we in community are de determined to create and live within the interdependent web held together with strands of love, forgiveness, compassion, trust, and hope. The gift of the beloved community is wrapped in the promise of love, to love one another as we love ourselves, to give to another because we would also want to receive. The gift of beloved community is created with a promise to hope that indeed we do learn as we go along, knowing that each day we can try again and that with daily practice that the beloved community is a real possibility. This gift of a beloved community can be enjoyed when we promise, the gift of a beloved community can be enjoyed as we promise, trust to allow ourselves to be vulnerable enough to reach out to love another person when we are scared to do so and trust enough to receive love that can heal our own wounds. I'll reflect again upon my stories about gifts I received. I received a set of doll dishes that showed me that my big sister loved me as much as a big sister could ever love a little sister, knowing full well that a six-year-old could not return a gift of such measure except by surprising her by putting beautiful agate rocks in her suitcase to take back to the city. In reflection, I received a gift that came with forgiving my mother for reinforcing my guilt and for coming to understand that in her motherly way, she did the best she knew how to respond to whatever daughterish behavior I was expressing. And I received the gift of a wonderful memory from the most beautiful 99-year-old woman I'd ever hoped to meet. These gifts were not given and received tit for tat, Rather, they were lessons about how to live and to learn as I grow old. In his essay about the nicest gift he had received, the Reverend Clark Dewey Wells says, enabling and confirming, bestowing and understanding self-esteem, help in time of trouble and delight for ordinary days. Enabling and confirming bestowing and understanding self-esteem, help in time of trouble and delight for ordinary days. 
he suggested that we draw up our list of the nicest gifts we have received so that it will give us perspective for the kinds of gifts we want to receive and the kind of gifts we want to give. So in this season of giving, engage that covenant, engage the promise and experience, experience the gift. We teach our children in our song, from you I receive to you I give, together we share and from this we live. In covenant, we promise to give and receive with open hearts and open minds and open hands. Within this community, may we find and feel that sacred connection in our relationship. So the divine is manifest between humans, from human heart to human heart, from human hand to human hand. We bond human to human by living out our promises. Experience these gifts. They are waiting to be opened.